The fourth tip these parents told me is they said that having fun wasn't haram in our home, but we kept the home environment as halal as possible. That's how I wrote up the tip. Another way I would write that tip is these parents were aware of the dangers of don't. Constantly telling your children don't. They were aware of the dangers of that. They told me, don't let your children grow up hearing no, 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 their whole life. No, you can't do this, we're Muslim. No, you can't do that, it's haram. No, you can't do that, Allah doesn't like it. Instead, their kids grew up hearing yes, 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 we can do this, of course. But they would guide their children in um, more towards the halal alternatives. And so what this means is you have to be really creative in the early years. So coming back to the point of having fun wasn't haram in our home, but we kept the home environment as halal as possible. I want to discuss a little bit of a tangent, but it's, it's got to do with this tip. And this is what I talked to the kids about yesterday here at IOK, sixth graders through 10th graders. And that is a subject that many Muslim communities don't feel comfortable talking about, but it's really, really important that we're open about it and we discuss it and we're not afraid of, of uh, educating our children about it as well. These families told me that they had a very tight control on the media in the home. They were really, um, th their internet was always used in a public space. It was never in the privacy of the kids' bedrooms. They played the video games that their children bought into the home with their children, so they knew exactly what kind of video games their kids were playing and enjoyed it with them. Um, they didn't watch TV day in, day out. The television set, you know, sometimes you go to people's homes and the television set is always on, right? Whether it's Bollywood or whether it's Baksani dramas or whether it's the American news, whatever, the TV is always on as background noise. With these families, there was a whole spectrum. I know families who ha didn't have a television in the set in the house, and I knew a family who had a movie theater in the house, like an actual movie theater with three or four rows of seats and a big screen and dark walls. But what the <coughs> the thing they all had in common was that the media was used very mindfully. So instead of having TV on day in day out, they would have something like a family movie night where the entire family would get together and watch a movie that they had selected and that was wholesome and that was clean and that they could all enjoy together and laugh and learn good lessons from. And so the kids had positive associations around media. Um, one, one incident that always comes to my mind is we used to do family movie night with my children. Once a week, all of us would get together and we would sit and we would watch a movie together and laugh and enjoy. But what happened was, and the other thing we used to do is, this is back when Borders was still around. Remember Borders Bookstore? They used to be open till like 11 o'clock midnight. We would take our kids to Borders on like Saturday night sometimes, and we would uh, get hot chocolate and cookies, and we would get really nice picture books, and we would sit and read to our kids. So we did family movie night, and then we would also go to Borders. And so um, what happened was over time, my husband and I started using the opportunity of our kids watching a movie that they enjoyed to have them watch their movie upstairs in the loft on the TV there, because we have two TVs in our house. And downstairs, my husband and I would watch the movie we wanted to see. So we were watching our movies separately. And I remember one weekend when we had selected our movies, my son Sean said to me, Mama, do you think that this weekend, instead of doing family movie night, we can go to Borders instead? And I said, yeah, we can, we can go to Borders, but, but then you won't get your movie night. Like, don't you want to watch your movie that you've been looking forward to all week? And he said, yeah, he said, but the whole point of family movie night was that we used to watch it together as a family. So if we're not going to do that, then let's just go to Borders and spend the time there, which that really had left an impression on me because what that told me was what he, he was really enjoying was that family bonding time. He wasn't interested in just being sat down in front of a TV by himself or with his brother. And Sheikh Hamza Yusuf said something that really um, resonated with me when, when our kids were little. He said that if Shaitan was to ring your doorbell, and you answered the door and Shaitan was standing there and he said, hi, I'm, I'm here to babysit your kids. What would you do? He said you would slam the door in your, his face and then you would run to go protect your children, right? But he said what's happened now is that we literally, he said, you let Shaitan babysit your children when you leave children alone to watch movies or TV shows that you have no idea what messages they're being given, what confusing messages they're being given. And so it's really important to be able to filter the messages for the kids. Like I, I know a dad who, uh, watched Frozen, the movie Frozen with his kids, and they enjoyed it, but the dad got his kids to think critically about the movie Frozen. He said, well, what, what is the meaning of the song, Let It Go? What does it mean that the, the female character is saying, just let it go, let it go, these rules don't matter, because there's lyrics that say, don't worry about the rules, right? And in the movie Frozen, if you've seen it, it shows that she's very, very concerned about her younger sister. She takes really good care of her, but the whole time she's taking care of her sister, they show her life as if it's very constricted and she's unhappy and miserable. But as soon as she lets it go 
and stops caring about her sister and abandons her. Then she's living in a castle and she's wearing like this sleeveless dress. And, you know, so what is the deeper message that's being given? So this was a way for, but the dad didn't say to his kids, no, haram, I'm not gonna let you watch a Disney movie. He watched it with them and then they talked about it. Like, well, what does that mean? And why did she look miserable helping her sister? How would you feel if you had to take care of your sister? You know, looking at it at a deeper level. But the thing I wanted to talk about that, that I mentioned that I feel Muslim communities aren't addressing, and I'm not exaggerating. I really am not when I say that this is now an epidemic. It's an epidemic not only in the greater society now, but it's an epidemic amongst our Muslim communities as well. And that is the addiction to pornography. There, it's, it's, rage, it's like a wildfire that's going through our communities. And just because you may not know about it or you may not have heard about it, doesn't mean it's not happening. It is happening. And every talk that I go to, it, it breaks my heart. Afterwards, I have grandparents, I have parents I, uh, coming to me crying, telling me stories about their children or their siblings or their spouses who are addicted to pornography. And so I gave this talk yesterday and I had a parent ask me, oh, well, my sixth grade daughter is going to be there at your talk. Is it appropriate for her? Should she be there listening to this talk? And I said, is she ever on the internet? Because if she's ever on the internet, then yes, she needs to be there at this talk. So we need to give our kids the tools to survive the world that's around them now. Ignoring it or pretending it's not out there isn't gonna help us. So the first thing I wanna tell you about the internet is that you have to treat the internet in your home like it's a loaded weapon. Literally, that's the best analogy I can give you. You have to treat the internet like it's a loaded weapon. And how do we treat a loaded weapon or a loaded gun? We don't ever leave children alone with it. We keep it under lock and key. We know where it is at all times. Um, we don't just give it to anybody to handle. So you have to treat, you have to be hyper aware of, of the internet. The other thing you have to do, the second tip about pornography is that you have to talk to your kids about it. You have to say that it exists and what it is. And the way we defined it for our kids is we just said it's movies that are out there of naked people doing weird things. That's it, we don't go into much more detail than that. But we say that it's movies about naked people doing weird things and it's an industry and they like to trap children into watching it and becoming addicted to it. And you know, my son, my youngest son, Rahim, we talked to him about it when he was nine years old and we would discuss it at the dinner table and um, give him the, the tools for how to deal with it. If It's not a matter of if they come or ever come across pornography, it's a matter of when. It's just a matter of time before something's gonna pop up on their screen or they're gonna click on something by accident. And like I said, after every talk, I learned something new. I just had a mom recently tell me that she was on Amazon looking for boys briefs for her son. And she typed up boys' briefs and kinky images came up of all sorts of other haram things. And she said that the pictures were really obscene and the private parts were just kind of blurred, but you could still see what it was. And that was on Amazon. And Sheikh Rami Ansur, who is my son's Quran teacher up north, he warned the kids that um, there have been incidents where there are videos that say Surah Mulk on YouTube. And kids will click on it or people will click on it to listen to Surah Mulk or watch Surah Mulk and it'll actually be pornography. Once it's discovered and it's reported, YouTube takes it down. But if you happen to be, or your child, God forbid, happens to be the first one to click on it, then, you know, it's a problem. So you have to talk to your kids about what to do if they ever come across it. And the third thing I wanna tell people about pornography is that there is no utopia. There is no perfect community or perfect country or perfect neighborhood or perfect place or environment where you can escape this. Nowhere. I had a cousin visiting me and she, we were talking about it because her children all had these internet gadgets that they were using and I was, we were talk, talking about the dangers of the internet and she said, oh, Hinabaji, thank God I, I live in such and such Islamic country. Over there, the government is so strict. And I didn't even have to say anything. Her husband just started shaking his head and he was like, no, honey. The, the top 10 countries that download porn, um, out of those top 10 countries, the top three countries are all Muslim countries, all Muslim countries that download the most porn. Um, it's really heartbreaking. So we have to, just like we teach our kids how to swim, or when our kids learn how to drive, we teach them how to be safe with seatbelts. Um, it's our job just to give them the tools how to deal, and then at some point they need to know the right thing to do if they come across something that's harmful to them. We pray for Allah's protection first and foremost, but we give them the tools as well. So. When my son Amin came here to Southern California, you know, we, we had pretty tight media rules in our home and Alhamdulillah, my siblings and I are on the same page. And so he was living with my brother and my brother told me, you know, Hina, we, I can watch over Amin all I want and we can have all the rules we, in, the, in the house that we have, but at some point he needs to know the right thing to do because IOK's high school program was online. So he would be on his laptop doing his homework and there were times my brother Faraz had to go to bed. 
And so he said, he needs to know what to do because I go to sleep. I don't know what could be popping up on his computer. So at that time, we came up with this drill. Just like we have safety drills at school or at work where, you know, um, if there's a fire, God forbid, stop, drop, and roll. Or if there's an earthquake, what is the protocol you use? You know, which exit do you go out of? How do you behave? Same way, we have to have drills in place about how to deal if pornography ever pops up on your computer or your phone or whatever. So what we told our kids was the first thing you do if pornography is ever to pop up in front of you. And we told them that something may pop up that looks weird to you. Just something that you're like, wait, I wasn't looking for that. That wasn't the website I was going for. That's not the image I was searching. You'll just know, you'll have this voice in your head and that voice is coming to you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's coming from the angels warning you that that feels weird. The first thing you do is you lower your gaze. You close the laptop or you turn off the computer or you uh, unplug, whatever. You Basically, you get it out of your vision. And it's interesting because at Elm Tree, my homeschooling co-op, one of the moms there is a marriage and family therapist. And she told us that, you know, they worked with sex offenders at one time in, in her training who were in prison. And she said they were taught as therapists to teach these sex offenders that if anything was ever to pop up or come in their sight, the first thing they have to do is look away. The first thing they have to do is to get it out of their sight of vision, which is really it shows you the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us to say? He tells us to lower the gaze, right? So lowering the gaze, there's real benefit in that. It's not just like, oh, we're so, you know, nervous, we can't look at anything. There's actually a protection of the heart and the soul of getting something out of your vision that is haram. And we told our kids that the first glance that is by mistake is a freebie. But after that, if you look again, that's when the angels start recording. So you have to be really mindful of like not going back to something that felt weird or uncomfortable. So the first thing is look away. The second thing we teach our kids is to immediately say, "Audhu billah min shaitan rajim," and we tell them that these are words of power. These are not magic words. They're, it's not mumbo jumbo. You have to know that when pornography or something like that pops up in front of you, you are in a shaitani environment. You're in the presence of shaitan, and you need protection. And the only one who can protect you is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. We ourselves have no power, so you immediately call on Allah's help for his, for his help. So "Audhu billah min shaitan rajim," and it was very very validating to me because I gave this talk at a Zaytuna College event up north, and there were. Um, after I was done giving my talk, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf gave his talk, his presentation, presentation which was on the danger of uh, the current media that's out there in the world. And he was not there when I gave my presentation. He arrived later for his talk. So he didn't hear anything I said. But when he got up on stage and he had a whole PowerPoint presentation and he went through all the different things that are out there in the world and how we need to deal, all of a sudden in his PowerPoint, he came to a black screen and in the middle of the black screen in white letters, it said, Audhu Billah Min Shaitan Rajim. And he talked about the exact same thing. He said, you need to rely on this and you need to use these words often. And so that was very validating to hear from the friend who's a therapist that even in the non-Muslim studies, that this is what they're teaching is to lower the gaze and look away and then to learn from the shuyukh that we have to rely on the billah min shaitan rajim. The third thing we told our kids after lowering the gaze and saying the billah min shaitan rajim is you need to immediately go and tell an adult. No matter what time of day it is, you need to go get help. You need to go let an adult know what's going on. Because many times what will happen is children will assume that the parents have no idea about pornography. And they'll think this is something I just discovered and I actually need to protect my parents. And so you need to let them know that I know what's going on and you need to come tell me. And so they need to, and, and they need to know that you're not gonna freak out, that you're not gonna blame them, that you're actually on their side and you're gonna help them. And so sure enough, one day, uh, Amin was doing his work at, at my brother's home and something popped up on his screen. And it was something he had not been looking for. He didn't know what it was. He immediately realized that this is the thing that we've been warned about. He turned off the computer, said, Audhu Billah Min Shaitan Rajim, and then went and told my brother. My brother came and looked at the computer, realized that there was a virus on it, and told him, okay, don't touch it. We'll get somebody to clean it up. And then, you know, took the computer away for a couple of days and then gave it back to him once it was clear. If we hadn't had that drill in place, I shudder to think about what might have happened, you know, like that curiosity that, oh, what is that? that that's, and then clicking on it and then the thing becoming bigger, taking over his screen. And so many times that's how it happens. Kids stumble across pornography. They don't know what it is. They click on it. And then it, the, the way it works is first it's curiosity. Then it becomes a pattern where a kid keeps returning to it to just kind of check it out. Then it becomes a habit where they have to do it on a regular basis. And then it becomes a compulsion where they can't leave it, even if they want to. And I know the story of this 10-year-old boy who was on the HIFS track, he was memorizing Quran, and his mother was thrilled. That's all she ever wanted was for one of her children to memorize Quran. 
And her son started memorizing surah after surah after surah. And he was totally like, yes, I want to be a Hafiz. The HIV school, that the program that he was a part of, all of the HIV students were given iPods to help them memorize Quran. So he used the iPod all the time while walking outside, while in the car, while in his bedroom or around the house, memorizing his surahs. And the mom was thrilled. All of a sudden, this son just lost. It seemed like it was all of a sudden, but it was gradual. The son lost interest in memorizing Quran. And he just told his mom, I can't do it anymore. I don't want to memorize Quran. And the mom was heartbroken. She was like, what happened? You know, she felt like maybe he got nazard or ayned, you know, the evil eye. And so, but she told him, okay, just keep working at it. But he was like, no, I'm, I'm not interested in, in memorizing Quran. One day she walked into his bedroom and she saw that he was on his iPod and his back was to her. And she saw that on his iPod, he was watching pornography. So when she and her husband, she and her husband investigated, they found out that this boy had been watching pornography every single day for two years, every single day from the ages of 10 to 12, this boy had been watching pornography. He is hopelessly addicted. It is one of the most tragic stories because I've been involved with the family, you know, trying to help and, and just be there. And this boy is much older now and um, he's still addicted. It, it's, um, the, the parents were really smart. They immediately got him into therapy. They got him into, um, uh, and there's actually therapy, a, a program now for Muslims called Purify Your Gaze. So if there's anyone struggling with it, Purify Your Gaze is a program. And when she first approached them when he was 12 years old, they said, no, we only work with adults. And um, inshallah, your son will be fine, you know, whatever. And, and so years went by, he's not fine. And all sorts of problems come about from it. This boy has been suicidal because there's so many times he's tried to quit pornography and he has not been able to, and he keeps going back to it. And so he despairs and he starts to feel like Allah can never forgive him. So they have him in therapy, but not only do they have him in therapy for his pornography addiction, but they also have him in spiritual therapy. They have him in therapy with the sheikh who's there to help him and remind him of Allah's mercy, remind him why he can't despair, remind him that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using this addiction just to break you. Allah is showing you that he's the master and you're the slave and you have to just turn to Allah completely, just helping him that way. But the thing about pornography addiction, which people don't realize is studies show first and foremost that most addiction happens between ages of 10 and 12. The other thing is they've actually done brain scans, actual brain scans on children who are addicted to pornography. And they have found that the hard wiring of the brain, the actual shape of the brain changes it actually changes. It, there's a physical effect of pornography addiction. And they said that the high that people get from watching pornography is the same high that people get from using cocaine and heroin. So it's like being addicted to cocaine and heroin. So his parents are treating it like an addiction now that they don't judge their son anymore. And recently the mom told me that after years of trying to deal with this, and they have a very open relationship with their son. The son will come to them and say, mom, dad, it's been a month. I haven't watched pornography. And they'll be like, wonderful, alhamdulillah. Then he'll come and say, it's been two months. I haven't watched any pornography. And they'll be really happy for him. And then he'll come and say, I, I watched pornography. I couldn't help it. I'm sorry. And he'll cry and they'll hug him. And, you know, so this is their life right now. And the mom told me recently after years of dealing with this, her husband is this big, you know, strong person. You doesn't show much emotion. She said the other day he just hugged her son and just broke down sobbing, just cried and cried and cried and told her, their son, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that this happened to you. And she said that it happened, you know, with Allah's will, but she said it ha the lesson they took from it is she said, we broke the number one rule, the number one rule, which is that you don't have internet in your bedrooms. She said the fact that our son had an internet device in his bedroom was our biggest mistake. And, um, so pray for him, inshallah. It's, it's a long journey and, uh, you know, they're trying to get him help. Uh, they've gotten him help, uh, but, you know, and it's, it's incredible. She paid $1,000 for somebody to come into the home and wire all the computers and put all the Wi-Fi code in her house changes every day. He actually tells the parents, don't go to sleep before me. He's a grown like kid now. And he will tell his parents, don't go to bed before me, because if you do, I'll watch pornography. Like, that's how bad it is. The three things about pornography, it's a triple A engine. It's affordability. Pornography is cheap, is free. And if it's not free, it's very cheap. Accessibility. It, you can access it anywhere. In the old days, you have, used to have to go to a video store. Now I could be watching it on my phone in front of you at the dining table and you would have no idea. Affordability, accessibility, and anonymity. The fact that nobody knows you're doing it. So what we as parents need to do is we can't do anything about the affordability. So we need to take away the accessibility and the anonymity. My sons did not have smartphones. Um, they did not have cell phones. Uh, until age 13. And then my son in high school got uh, a flip phone. 
and people would, the kids would take pictures of his flip phone because they'd be like, what is that? Do these things actually exist? But he did not get a smartphone until now, until age 18. My son Amin, we prayed about it quite a bit before letting him get a, an iPhone because he's driving here in Southern California now and he needs GPS and whatnot. But my husband has a thing set up on his phone that anything he looks at or any text he gets or sends out, my husband gets a copy of it. So we trust him. We, inshallah, he won't do anything wrong, but still it's, you know, we need to, um, they need to be aware at, at this age while they're still developing. But for some kids, you can tell them Allah sees you. You're not alone. Allah sees you. Some kids, that'll be enough. But for other kids, you're going to have to tell them about the, the medical effects, the physical effects, what happens with addiction, how marriages get affected. And um, somebody asked my son in high school, why don't, no, I asked my son, why don't you watch pornography, my 18 year old? Like why you could, you could get away with it at anyone's home. Why do you choose not to? And he said that he was once in a dars and he heard the sheikh say something that had a real effect on him. And he said it was, the sheikh said, Iman gets pulled out of your eyes. Iman gets pulled out of your eyes. And he said that freaked him out. For him, that was enough. Alhamdulillah, may, may he stay.